Well, what a terrific uh, start to the afternoon and to the to the dialogue, and that I uh, I want to now take the opportunity to introduce the moderator of the next panel, someone who I've got to know because he's the CEO of Kemen Industries, which are located here in Des Moines, and uh, got to know them first uh, of the Nelson family and his mom and dad, R.W. and Mary Nelson, and uh, 50 years ago, plus a little, started this company and built it into a global powerhouse in terms of its impact. I think the company touches half the world's population every day with their products. Uh, so, you know, he said that, and then I was in India and saw their operation myself and saw how they're out at the, at the farm gate and bringing those technological innovations of change. In addition, uh, so now uh, R.W. and Mary turned to Chris Nelson to be the day-to-day -day CEO of the company. And as he continues to build it, uh, I try to see him uh, whenever he's in town, but he's not here much because he is out everywhere. And Kemen has been one of the few uh, companies designated by the World Food Program to be an advisor to all that they do. And they've done just remarkable things. And uh, now in, the, in this panel, uh, they're going to be adapting to change the role of animal protein in feeding a hungry world, something that Chris Nelson is doing every day. So Chris, over to you. Well, thank you, Ken, and thanks everyone here for uh, being here this afternoon. Uh, it's been my pleasure to be able to attend the, this symposium for many years in the past. But uh, one of the things of us who are in animal agriculture, we always notice that, well, it seems we talk a lot about crops, but how often do we really talk about animal agriculture, the, the actual consumers of much of the crops that are produced? One of the things that I would like to take a few seconds to focus on is perhaps that uh, the differences between what I would call <laughs> acute, acute malnutrition and chronic malnutrition. Acute ma malnutrition, oftentimes when we see this throughout the world, of where we are in a, an acute phase of people without food. And that normally translates into a caloric deficit. We are simply not being able to deliver calories to people so that they can meet their daily need. Chronic nutrition oftentimes, though, has to do with protein malnutrition. The 2,000 or 2,300 calories that we need per day are oftentimes overlooked that we need in that 2,300 calories 52 grams of protein. And that 52 grams of protein, whether that's derived from vegetable or animal sources, most importantly, must contain the essential amino acids that are required for all of human life. Oftentimes, we talk, unfortunately, about caloric needs or protein needs and fail to go to the next level, which means our requirement for 240 milligrams of lysine per day and our requirements for 80 milligrams of methionine. Vegetable proteins can provide many of these, most of these, if provided in sufficient quantities. But oftentimes the concentration contains within vegetable proteins is simply insufficient to be able to meet the protein requirements, especially of growing children. It is at that point where protein from animal sources can become essential for overall human development. Whether we constitute one egg per child per day, or a number of milliliters of milk, or a small portion of chicken meat, all of these provide the essential components that are required for human growth. And it is this focus 
that the animal feeding industry and the animal production industry looks to to provide. Today, we've got a very good group, a very distinguished set of panelists who are going to be able to talk to us a little bit about, from a practical aspect, what is happening with animal production in two of the largest population centers of the world, China and India. And in those countries, how the challenge of meeting the protein requirements of all citizens, whether regardless of where they are on the pyramid, has to be met. The nutrients that are available from protein from animal sources constitute in the American diet nearly 23% of the energy and 63% of the protein requirements that we have. They also constitute 99.9% .9 of the requirements for vitamin B12 and 56% of the requirements for vitamin A, 56% of the requirements for zinc. These essential nutrients form really the basis of animal protein and its essentiality. The questions and controversies around animal protein, though, remain many. Oftentimes, opponents of animal protein will talk first about beef, which I still refer to as our luxury protein, and refuse to talk about the essentiality and the efficiency that is seen in milk production, egg production, and chicken production, which in large part constitute the protein sources that are, that are needed and have the ability to be able to feed those parts of the world that are suffering from chronic protein nutrition. I would like to introduce our two panelists for today and our translator. We have uh, uh, been very, very welcome to, wel welcome to the United States, uh, first of all. Mr. Bulram uh, Yandav, who's Managing Director of Goodrich Agrotech, Agrovet in India. Goodrich Agrovet is part of the overall Goodrich Group, a $6 billion company in India. $600 million of that, in, of that sales yearly is done by the, the Agrovet Group. They are some of the leaders in chicken production as well as in dairy production within the country and leaders uh, in egg production as they are feedi uh, producing feed for those animal sectors. Our second panelist today uh, comes from China, uh, Mr. Shoshun Wang. Mr. Wang is chair founder and chairman of the Shandong Shintang Company. It's the leading broiler company in Shandong province, uh, producing nearly 90 million broilers a year. They've been an e essential part of providing broilers throughout the, throughout the China area and into royal, rural China to be able, again, to be able to meet that protein deficiency that was uh, so rampant in China until a few years ago. The company uh, contains both uh, fee breeding, feeding uh, operations, as well as farms, slaughtering, and processing of chickens to be able to produce ready-to-eat ready products that are uh, produced and sold throughout China. These two uh, gentlemen are going to be able to comment to us on a variety of topics that uh, deal with animal agriculture and especially questions of sustainability. Uh, but before we begin, I want to ask each of them to come to the podium to make a couple of brief comments as they see the place of animal agriculture. So uh, first of all, uh, Boram, if I could ask you to the podium, please. Please welcome Mr. Boram Yandu. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chris, uh, for this introduction. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I will humbly try and make the case for animal agriculture in India, home to over 1,200 million people, a fifth of them below poverty line who fight hunger on daily basis. India recently enacted a historical legislation called the National Food Security Bill, which will allow nearly two-thirds of Indians to access cereals like wheat, rice, and coarse grain at highly subsidized price between two cents to six cents a kilo. Most of the focus of our policymakers and the world at large is restricted to availability of calories 
as an index of hunger and undernutrition. This view completely ignores the non-availability of protein as an important dimension of hunger, the point which Chris made so beautifully. India is a protein deficient country. The big myth is that India is predominantly a vegetarian country. It is totally incorrect. As per our National Food Survey statistics, 78% of Indians eat non-veg, but are forced vegetarians due to unaffordability. In 2012, we produced nearly 7.5 7 million tons of nutritional protein from animal sources, milk, aquaculture, meat, and eggs, and only about 4.5 million tons from vegetarian sources, not counting the protein contribution of cereals. It is widely accepted that animal protein is much more similar to our own bodies and contain higher level of essential amino acids and are more efficiently digested than most plant proteins. Moreover, it is a very efficient way of converting inedible plant products like brands, cakes, extractions, roughages, and crop residues into good quality edible protein. As India becomes richer and it middle, its middle class expands, we are seeing a rapid growth of animal protein industry. Though our per capita consumption of animal protein is much lower than the world average, and even the recommendations of WHO, they are rising rapidly. In past five years, 37% of agricultural growth output came from animal protein. Within this category of output of eggs and meat has risen faster, and poultry the fastest. There is a joke in India that the IT sector and the poultry sector have done really well without support of the government in any way possible. The reason people give is one that is the IT sector they did not understand and the, the poultry sector they did not bother. So all this growth has come at its own steam, so which is commendable. Animal agriculture today accounts for nearly 30% of our agricultural GDP, and we believe that by year 2025, it may account for nearly 50% of our agri-GDP. It is not surprising that India has become first in milk production, second in freshwater aquaculture, third in egg production, fourth in broiler meat production. In last few years, it has become one of the top beef exporters in the world. Poultry sector alone created nearly 3.8 million rural jobs in India in last five years without any government support. And one appreciation of our current RBI governor, who is an eminent uh, World Bank economist. As India grows, feeding its 1,200 million people will always be a challenge. We shudder thinking about drought as more than 40% of Indian agriculture is still dependent on monsoon. While animal protein sector has done well, the future looks even brighter. It will have to overcome several challenges. Disease continues to be one single biggest challenge, be it bird flu in poultry, viral outbreaks in our equa, or the recent FMD outbreak in uh, cattle in several parts of India. As fodder areas compete with food areas, crippling fodder shortages might hit milk production in future. Even though we may be number one in milk production, yield levels are very low. Nearly 300 million cows and buffaloes produce 135 million tons of milk. We also cannot ignore the emission of methane by them and its lethal impact on global warming. As the industry adopts modern technology, it also faces severe talent competition from the more glamorous services and manufacturing sector. I was thrilled when the lady made this comment that our sector is not sexy and cool. And I, and I realize that how, <laughs> how true you are, because our problem today is to attract talent to this sector. This list is very long, and the, the animal agriculture industry and the policy makers have their job cut out for future. Thank you. And now my, my uh, pleasure to introduce Mr. Wong and our translator today, uh, Mr. Feng Long Yu, from, uh, also from Kemen. Please come up. Uh, 
大家好，非常高兴的来到美墩，在这里五票乡生态一，就像和我的家乡山东省烟台市松平区一样的，没英语话。Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, firstly,、um, to Dr. Nelson and all for having me in this dialogue. It is my pleasure to come to Des Moines and to, to attend this great event. The beautiful landscape here reminds me of my hometown, Yantai. I am a Chinese immigrant. From 1993, I 主要是从事有机业务，到目前，公司已形成了有机产业一条龙的企业集团，实现了从中级饲养、初级孵化、饲料加工、商品级饲养，到屠宰性加工，一条龙的全产业链的覆盖，公司。位于富有“南山北海”之称的滨海青石，烟台市牟平区。目前，公司已成为山东省有机产业较大的供应商，在全国也属于为名为名前列。现已成为肯德基、麦当劳、双规发展等。国有几名的企业，中国核心的供应商。Uh, I'm a farmer from China, starting as a small broiler farm in 1993. My company expanded quickly and was named Shandong Xiantan Group in 2001. Now it has developed into a large broiler integrator in China. Our business,、uh, including breeding. Hatching, feeding, and processing.、Uh, my company and I dedicated to providing people with green, safe, and healthy chicken meat. Our our unique location is in beautiful seaside city Yantai, makes broiler farming environmental friendly. We are one of the largest chicken meat producer in Shandong, and have been core suppliers of McDonald's. KFC and also Shanghai Group in China. 二十多年前，中国的有机产业刚刚起步，动物食品供不应求。行业当时的目标是把鸡肉生产出来，让百姓不再缺少禽肉，完成了从无到有的过程。随着社会的发展。人民生活水平不断的改善，推动了中国有机产业的蓬勃发展。随着大量的鸡肉的进口和中国本土企业的茁壮成长，生产的鸡肉完全满足了中国居民消费的需求，确保了足量的供应。未来。人们对身体健康的专注的程度逐步的提高，食品的安全、营养与健康、营养与保健等，被社会强烈的需求。因此，如何让居民吃上优质、健康、美味的低油产品，确保质量，成为行业发展的目标。But 2,000 years ago, China's broiler farming just started. There was a short supply of protein food, not to mention healthy and delicious food. That's why I had this simple dream, raising chicken to meet my people's requirement. A lot of Chinese farmers had this same dream as mine. For so many years, we have worked together to promote China's broiler industry and solve the problem 
of supplying protein food for a lot of Chinese people. Since we have meat on many uh, families dinner table, we're facing a new problem. What we need to think about now is how to provide my people with more quality, healthy, and delicious chicken meat products. This is a question that my new dream has meant to answer, to build a green industry and to produce healthy food. Yanjungla 蛋白食品地, I'm a farmer with a beautiful dream. I have witnessed China's broiler industry to develop from scratch. With the development of the industry, Xiantan employees and I have turned Xiantan from a qualified protein food supplier into a distinguished food producer. 最后, 祝愿, 各位女士, 各位先生, uh, so many thanks for everybody, everybody and uh, hope everybody keep health and happy. Thank you so much. Well, very good. We've got a, a variety of questions for uh, the panelists. I, I want to think I, I would like to start off with my first question dealing with uh, the issue of sustainability. And in the animal feed industry, I know one of the principal ways that we measure uh, our overall efficiency is by feed to gain ratios. In other words, how much, how much animal do we produce for a particular amount of feed? Uh, it's rare that an industry has a, a major economic me metric that is directly correlatable to sustainability. Obviously, the more meat you can produce, for the fewer amounts of grain that you use, the more sustainable you are. There's been great progress on feed to gain uh, ratios, both in broilers, layers, even in dairy cows in the last few years. Where do you see the future uh, of that going? And maybe, Boram, I'll start with you. And, and are, we at a, are we at a peak, or are, is there continued progress to make? If you're asking me, uh, and if I've understood it correctly, sustainability means that will we have enough raw materials and will we continue to improve in efficiency? As far as India is concerned, I, the answer is a very big yes. Uh, we will not run out of feed ingredients for quite some time because our yield levels are very low. If you take our corn productivity is two and a half tons, so we can triple with the same land as the hybrid penetration improves. And uh, in soya, we produce about a ton per hectare, which can also be doubled. And presently, also, half our soya meal is exported. So we still have a long way to go. As far as efficiency improvement is there, both nutrition and genetics have done tremendous job, particularly in broiler and layer in the country. 10 years ago, we talked about 2 kg feed for a kg of live weight. But today, we are talking about 1.6 kg. And uh, uh, I think. Uh, I don't think anything is impossible because chicken is actually 70% water. So we can really, really work towards making the FCR even below one because nobody would have believed if I, we would have talked about 1.5, 1.6 FCR uh, a few years ago, but it has, science has made it possible. As far as uh, beef, cattle, and uh, swine is concerned, India is not a pork and a beef country. Most of the animals are spent animals. We don't slaughter cows because of religious reasons. Buffaloes are slaughtered, and most of it is exported. Yeah. Mr. Wong, obviously, China has been able to see tremendous efficiencies. Feed to gain ratios have decreased significantly. Do you think in China that we're going to see further, further uh, decreases in feed to gain ratios? I don't know if you see. 
，中国也是在建立这个饲料转化率啊，在这个在这个问题上，我们做了哪些工作？饲料转化率可以。这个中国对动物细菌蛋白这个的供给需求经历了一定的旺盛和平稳的阶段，从而呢。也影响到了一定的农业的呃种植的格局，但从食品的这个粮食安全这方面，中国对一些技术性的粮食的种植，比如水稻、小麦，也更为的重视。Actually, uh, China has、uh, endeavor to uh in, to uh increase the uh, feed. Uh, uh, efficacy, and now we are focused on um, the, the breeders, um, um, and also um, uh, the quality of the feed. So uh, I think uh, China will uh, improve these uh, sort of uh, works continuing continuously, and those and also uh, we will see the food safety, food supply safety supply. And uh, China actually, uh, we maintain uh, also maintain some uh, uh, crops like rice and wheat, because everybody knows if we if we uh, feed a lot of animals, we can uh, lose uh, about ten percent of our uh, total crops. Okay, because uh, it's a it's a it's a nutrition concept. So, uh, so Chinese government firstly maintain the. Uh, Maintain the food, uh, food supply like uh, rice and wheat, and also uh, will also increase the productivity of the animals. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. 动物蛋白的需求。And, uh, just to continue uh, answering this question, China also uh, export, uh, no, imported a lot of uh, soybeans, uh, soybean meals and corns from like uh, U.S. and to meet the growth of the animal protein requirement. Okay. So, yeah. Yeah. That, that sort of almost brings me to my next question is, is that uh, in the United States, if we leave ethanol out of the equation, nearly 80% of the corn is fed to animals. 85% uh, of the soybeans are fed to animals in the United States. As you look in China or India, and we see an increasing amount of grains being fed to animals, First of all, my first, I guess my first question is, do you see a development of alternate, alternate grains coming or alternate feed sources replacing some of these traditional corn and soybean based diets, which I know are predominant in both of your countries? Uh, Mr. Wong, maybe we start with you on that question. Because 面子婆，呃，和其他的一些，呃，这个葵花葵花籽婆，来取代这个豆粕的使用。Actually, uh, uh, with the uh, increasing uh, price increasing, uh, imported from uh, soybean meal, for example, uh, from U.S., especially from the end of last year, uh, Chinese government also Chinese uh, feed companies already. Um, uh, Exchange, uh, change some ideas to, we have to uh, make some replacement of the uh, protein, okay, protein uh, resources. Uh, actually, we, uh, we are using now, uh, using uh, oil, um, cotton seed and uh, um, some vegetable seed 
uh, just like these uh, the, uh, cotton seed mills or uh, vegetable seed mills to replace the soybean protein. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. I think we see the similar trends in India. One good thing about India is that it has reasonably good diversity in oil seeds. We produce a lot of groundnut uh, extractions. We produce a lot of cotton seed extraction, rape and mustard extraction. But uh, they can be used in larger quantities in layer feed, but have strong limitation as far as broiler rations are concerned. Uh, as far as uh, uh, grains are concerned, we also produce millets because large part of India is rain-fed agriculture. So we produce this millet called bajra, which, is re which replaces uh, corn very well. But I need to say something that corn yields are improving uh, at the rate of about 8 to 10 percent Kegar for last several years. As I, re as I said, that penetration of hybrids increased, so the yield also increased. We have become a net exporter of corn, and we believe that, uh, uh, and India is not a very big corn consumer as, as a grain. We are still dependent on wheat and rice, which are not used in animal agriculture at all. Very good. Um, this question uh, may be directed just to Mr. Yadav because uh, you're involved in milk production. Um, one of the problems uh, in, mil in furthering milk production in India, I know, is just the lack of forages. And oftentimes we hear much about grain yields and we need to raise their overall grain yields, but very rarely do I hear anything about raising the, the total forage yield per hectare. Uh, and this is a critical, a critical nutrient for dairy cows. What are you seeing in, in, as uh, India tries to develop more of its milk economy? Is, is forage going to be a big issue, do you think? Uh, India has a crippling shortage of forage and dry fodder. But let me step back and say what has changed in India in the last five, years, five, six years. The best thing which has happened in India is uh, the increase in food prices. They have increased at 12, 13 percent kegar in the last five, six years. A lot of economists call it food inflation. But uh, we feel that it is more money in the farmer's pocket. When 60% of the population gets richer, they, they, the country really benefits. What it has also done is that it has made, after a very long time, Indian agriculture very remunerative. It's a profitable venture. And as the lady said that in the earlier panel, that our farmers treat it as business. So, Five, six years, seven years ago, 7% 7 of total arable land was under fodder. Now only 4% is under fodder. But in last one year, things have changed. The fodder prices have gone so much. Because the milk prices have risen, the farmer wants to produce more. They cannot change the genetics immediately. But what can they change? They can change the nutrition. And fodder prices have risen. In last two years, I see so many companies, so many multinationals have come with uh, hybrid fodder crops like uh, sorghum, Sudan grass, and other things. There is a very big market developing in India for forage seed. The government is putting focus. So I think we have reached a level where if the government does not interfere too much, we can achieve very good business ba balances in the production of various crops and various things to keep this animal agriculture growth engine going. Okay, very good. I want to compare and contrast maybe China and India in one aspect. And of course, uh, India uh, does not utilize GMO crops, and short of cotton, but I mean in animal feeding uh, does. Uh, China has a variety of GMO crops. Um, and I don't know if the two of you have compared relative productivities in your two countries, uh, although I know that the broiler productivity is about the same. I, I guess we'll start with Mr. Wong. Mr. Wong, do you think that, the, that China is having an advantage in its animal agriculture because you have GMO crop availabilities? And uh, Varun, do you think there's a disadvantage to India because you don't have GMO crops? I think China is a very interesting industry. It's a very interesting industry. It's a very interesting
是否能满足我们行业的需要。那么对目前来讲，我们已经用的部分来讲的饲料原料的转基因，从我们的使用的效果来看，应该讲来讲，对于我们的生生产出的机油的产品。呃，应该讲来讲还是质量还是比较可靠的。In China, actually, uh, everybody knows that China is the biggest population in, China, in the world. So the the foremost thing is to so how to how to meet the requirement on the food supply. Maybe the same in India, okay? Yeah. And uh, in China, not only uh, in the feed industry uh, for GMO, and also I think. Uh, Many Chinese people already uh, eat the GMO food, okay? So currently, uh, we have not seen any uh, negative effect of GMO feed or food. So uh, actually, the advantage is uh, uh, GMO feed has uh, provided a lot of uh, raw material resources to Chinese feed industry. So I think our government will uh, continue this uh, strategy or policy to improve Using of GMO feed crops, I think. Yeah. India. India, a case for GMO is already made because uh, we have seen the revolution the cotton has done. The yield levels have doubled, and in three, four years, GMO penetration in cotton from 20, 30 percent has gone to 95 percent plus. Uh, as far as uh, animal agriculture is concerned, are we feeling the pinch? The answer is not yet because we are still surplus in soya extraction. We are still measuring up to all the corn production and corn output we need. But in time to come, maybe five, seven years later, when the yield becomes a critical factor in increasing production, we will probably have to think very seriously about uh, GMO crops to feed the growing population of the country. Very good, very good. We hear a lot about uh, climate change and obviously the, the earth getting warmer. And uh, from a scientific standpoint, it doesn't seem deniable anymore that that is a, certainly a, a phenomenon that's happening. As you see the warming of the climate, we know that this is affecting, of course, a variety of crop productions. But I very rarely hear anybody talking about how this is, is affecting animal production. Uh, within India and China, and maybe we'll start with India first, how, are, how do you see this climate change affecting overall animal productivity and uh, changes in India and then maybe to China? So Indian narrative uh, on climate change uh, is restricted to the manufacturing sector right now. And I think government have enacted a lot of legislations in trying to control that. And the legislations have under come under severe criticism also because it has truncated the manufacturing activity to a certain extent. As far as agriculture is concerned, it is still considered a holy cow. I'll be very frank with you that 300 million animals uh, are a biggest contributor to methane emission and GHG emissions, and nobody talks about it. But I think there are several things which are changing. One of the things which is changing is that people are realizing that having such a large herd of unproductive animals uh, is uneconomical. So at some point in time, religion and economics will have start having a dialogue. And that we are seeing last year drought, we saw reduc severe reduction in our herd, herd uh, size as far as cows were concerned. And I feel that the number, the population of cows in the country is not likely to grow in future. The only thing is the salience of crossbred will continuously go up and the yield levels will continuously grow up. In last five, six years, we have seen that yield is contributing more than the population as far as growth of milk is concerned. Coming to buffaloes, buffaloes can be slaughtered. We are becoming very beef, big beef exporter. Last year, we exported almost $4 billion uh, of beef. We are likely to grow 25% this year again with the rupee depreciation. We have become even more competitive uh, uh, than the rest of the world. So I feel that in some way, the natural balance will come in, in climate change from the animal agriculture sector by restricting the herd flock, which will happen automatically. If you ask me whether government will take steps or will we improve the digestion and other things in the next five years to restrict that, the answer is no. So overall, you're saying in India, the number of cows is going to go down just because as a result of it, and thus we should have an impact actually on the climate, yeah. How about in China, Mr. Wang? 
但是这个气候对于养殖的影响啊，这是你怎么看我们这个这个行业的这种生态？对气候的主要影响的因素、啊，一个是碳的排放，第二个来讲就是粪便的影响。那么从这一方面呢，我们家禽对这个碳的排放量。呃，比牛、猪，啊，相对还要小，这也是我们有机产业的一个优势之一。但是，作为一个养殖者，我会积极的面对这个问题，积极的改善我们的饲养设施，提高我们生产效率，减少环境的污染和减少碳的排放，使我们的这个产业可持续的稳定的发展。Actually, uh, Chris has said a uh, very important uh, issue that uh, global warming, and uh, I think one of the main main uh, uh, factor is the uh, carbon dioxide, carbon dioxide, uh, carbon em emission. And uh, for uh, Mr. Wang's company, and he just his suggestion is uh, to enhance the uh, feeding uh, productivity, and uh, uh, may strengthen the uh, administration of the farm and uh, also um, uh, to culturing uh, uh, better uh, breeders. Yeah. So I think that's his, uh, his answer. Yeah. It's very good. Mm -hmm. I wanted to add one more question. Sure, go ahead. I missed one point. One is that um, recently uh, our company act has been changed and 2% of our PAC has to be spent on CSR activity. And the good thing is that most of the companies are thinking of two very important things in CSR. One is environment, and second is uh, skill development. And I think both things will help animal agriculture. There we go. Very good. Sorry. Thank you. Um, my next question is is a really sort of a somewhat unique to animal agriculture, and that is in the last year, especially in China, we saw the, the spread of disease from animals to humans, avian influenza, which uh, obviously the disease itself has, has a very negative effect on animals, but now obviously the, the chances of, of these vectors going from animals to humans. As animal production increases and the, and the desire for more animal protein increases, one would think that the risk is going to go up. As a producers of animals, uh, especially chickens, how does, uh, Mr. Wong, how do you see your company responding to avian influenza in, the, in that regard? <laughs> Between 对我们这个产业呢，所以我们是很大的一个影响。并且也威胁到人类的健康。啊，这个病因呢，接到现在呢，我们一些业内的专家，人类在继续的研究，它传染的根源。Yes, Chris, all right. Um, especially this year, uh, avian influenza has uh, impact our business a lot. You know, uh, um, it's not only uh, infected in the <coughs> birds, fox, but also already uh, caused people death. So uh, Chinese government and all, all, almost all, every Chinese people pay more attention to this <coughs> issue. Um, actually, uh, um, until now, uh, some, um, uh, I think many Chinese uh, broiler producers a negative profit, okay? Though the price of the broiler broil was um, increased a bit, increased to some extent. Um, okay. 
圣训呢，在我们业内的专家的研究和我们的总结，呃，一定能把这个问题能及早的根除来解决。但是，作为一名有机养殖者，我会首要的责任就是搞好生物安全，搞好预防。减少此类病情的发生。呃、uh, ，So the government and the scientists,、uh, they are just focusing, endeavor, endeavor to、um, find the the reason, okay, the real reason,、uh, and the real、uh, effective path.、Uh, how how can the how can the、uh, virus affect human being? But for、uh, for our farmers, what we can do、uh, is To、uh, prevent, to to do better、uh, prevention of the diseases,、uh, such as、um, do、uh, such as uh, um, enhance the uh, um, our uh, facility uh, to raise birds, and also、uh, to make the, the house、uh, make the house、uh, birds house、uh, cleaner. cleaner. And、uh, we hope uh, for the, uh, for, uh, from the efforts from the government scientists and also the farmers, we we hope we can solve this problem、uh, in the future. Okay. 据我据我了解，将我们二零一三年所谓感染的应该染的禽流感的病情啊，基本都是在我们的菜市场有过的接触者。到目前为止啊，我们整个的家禽业，特别是我们的有机这个产业，从事这项工作者，一例也没有。The <coughs> Mr. Long just argued that this issue that actually、uh, the the patient who、uh, who be infected by avian influenza is not the、uh, the worker from our industry, okay? It's just the people outside the industry. Maybe somebody、uh, when they buy some chickens in market, then infect it. So、uh, I think nobody in this in this industry should be a fear <laughs> on it.、Okay. Well, and and I would I would point out that the disease has transmitted from animal to humans probably since man first domesticated animals, and in some cases I go back in history. This was positive when、uh, the cowpox was、uh, acquired by milking. Cows、uh, that prevented smallpox. So it's it's certainly one of the one of the factors of life. In in India,、uh, Boram, do you, what do you see? Actually, the the problem is very real, and we have seen the devastating impact of bird flu in uh, Asia, uh, particularly. Not so much in India, but several parts of Southeast Asia have seen mixed farming, where swine and chicken are raised together, and that's very serious problem. But the point is. The marginal farmers do that, and you cannot tell them not to do it and deprive them of their livelihood. I think the proactive role of government throughout Asia is very important in this in this uh, uh, in this uh, particular aspect.、Uh, industry has, particularly in India and several parts of Asia, I go. Industry has done their job of educating the farmer on biosecurity, taking measures for prevention of disease. But I think immunization still remains in the control of the government, and the risk assessment of government is not always、uh, always correct as far as immunization programs are concerned. The second thing is that since these diseases are viral diseases, the mutation happens very quickly. So immunization is one part, and second is development of、uh, e、evolution of immunization br by bringing in private sector vaccine companies. Is very very important、uh, method of containing this problem, and I think、uh, big countries like China, India, and Thailand, etc., will have to do that, and they're doing that. I I suppose so, but I think they have to do more of it into secure the、uh, human health. One of the things is it's well recognized that nearly a billion families、uh, rely on animal agriculture、uh, for their livelihood, and and whether that's at very small stakeholders. To very large stakeholders,、uh, animal agriculture remains very key. 
Um, as I see the development, say, in rural China and also in rural India, the importance of a place to sell your crop, in other words, a market, and the market being a place that makes f animal feed would seem a very logical first market for many, many, many of these, uh, for the, many of the grain farmers, and then eventually going back to the, the uh, small stakeholders. Especially in India, I know your company with very widespread throughout the country, have you seen a growth of, a of purchased animal feed uh, as, a, as a source of further economic development among small stakeholders? Uh, the penetration of compound feed is, is, is getting better every, uh, every year. Uh, one of the reasons is that demand for animal protein is rising and uh, genetics takes a lot of time to change. But nutrition can deliver very quick results. At least we can push the animal to genetic potential in a very short time. So that is one of the reasons why uh, things are changing, particularly in the dairy sector. In poultry sector, I think more, almost 90% is very well organized. It is consolidated. It matches with the world standard in production. And you know that you've been visiting India. The only thing is that we are not going whole hog by processing and getting into food. But as far as the production systems are concerned, they are very, very well organized as far as poultry is concerned. Yeah. Mr. Wong, and uh, obviously your company in China has been very involved in the broiler industry. How have you seen the development of the layer industry uh, providing eggs, especially in rural China? Is it going to undergo some of the same changes that were that you saw as a small broiler farmer when you started and now a very large broiler farmer, you see that happening within the, the uh, egg laying industry in China. The layer industry? Is this the uh, track the same? Yes. Uh, okay. Tung 我想这也是我们整个来讲的家庭产业的发展的目标。单机的应该讲，我认为呃，最终的发展的这个方向，与同有机相同。You can check, check back to 20 years ago, and you see Chinese broiler industry um, developed very fast. But uh, from his um, perspective, Chinese layer industry also will uh, improve very quickly. Okay, just at uh, just can trace uh, the past what our broiler uh, industries had. Okay. Yeah. Well, we are out of time. Uh, I would like to thank our, our panelists and our translator very much for their participation today. And uh, hopefully that everyone in the audience has learned a little bit more about uh, animal agriculture within uh, these two very, very critical developing markets in the world. Uh, thank you very much and uh, shishin ni.